You want your dog to be a champion, you gotta raise your dog like a champion and not just worry about that defensive posture, that defensive lens where you're just you know pushing away from stuff. I don't wanna be fat. No, get, get at the gym, you're an athlete. Stop saying I don't wanna be. Just say I am and then start moving. And so this is what we're gonna do to make sure you reach your goals. Just like everybody else world class that is out there killing it. You are world class, you are a champion. You are an athlete within a puppy training season. What is up champion puppy owners? Do you really wanna streamline ownership experience? Do you really wanna socialize dog with manners, responsiveness, and general life skills? Great, you're in the right place. This podcast is for accountable puppy owners who want to better know and grow their dogs. Time to put on your big girl panties, buckle up, and ride with me. Pat Quinn, the founder and creator of the Champion Puppy Training System. Let's go. All right, so as I am recording this, we are just breaking into 2019. Now, the goal with this podcast is to have it be evergreen content. That means the information contained in this, I don't think is going to change that much five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, hopefully in 20 years it changes, Um, but hopefully not by a ton. I think that the info that I bring to the table for you guys is tried and true and it's not going anywhere. So there might be variations to it, upgrades, you know, peeling back the other layer of the onion to help you better understand this stuff. But remember, if you're listening to this a year from now, two years from now, in the middle of summertime, we're not just breaking into the new year, I want you treating every single day like it's January 2nd. The reason why I say January 2nd and not January 1st is a lot of us are still nursing our hangovers and just getting into things, and then all of a sudden, you know, when you go back to work on the 2nd, you you, you hit that intensive uh, lifestyle, hopefully not temporarily. But every day should be January 2nd for you. So if you're listening to this, again, years from now, you're listening to this in the middle of summertime, you have a new puppy, more than likely. Even if you have an older dog, I want you to look at it as a temporary season of go, a temporary season of serving, a temporary season of learning. And in this temporary time, that you're giving it 110%, it will have long-term results. Again, a lot like my podcast. I'm putting this out here for you today, but my hope is is this sticks around for a while, so I'm not gonna make a big splash when I first um, put this podcast out there, only a handful of you will listen, but I can guarantee you, as long as I'm alive over time, there will be a lot more ears listening to this podcast, as my intention is not just to put this out here for a a temporary season and and keep it moving, just like your intention with your puppy is to do something that is very difficult in nature for a short period of time, something that you might not completely understand, but you're gonna keep chipping away at, but you're gonna have lifelong results. With that said, let's get into the podcast, treating every single day like it's January 2nd. Today's podcast, we're gonna talk about setting and achieving puppy training goals. So how do you start the goal setting process? I, I'm gonna give you my take on it. I'm sure there's a bunch of different ways. Most of them have things in common, like measurable and you gotta write them down and all that common stuff. So I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit, but I'm gonna give you my version. Why? Because this is my podcast. and. I'm gonna have you achieve my results. My results are high results. So, here's my version of how to set and achieve puppy training goals. Start with the end goal in mind. What do you really envision? What do you aspire to achieve? What did you not get with your last dog? What scares you about your neighbors or your your in-laws or your siblings dog when you go over there and they're out of control? or you see a dog that maybe wasn't socialized correctly and you know can't be around your kids or other dogs. So I want you to tap into the, the like, what do I aspire? That whole like aim for the moon sort of thing. And this is the, 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 the thing about aiming for the moon. And when people say you might just get the stars, 
That's nonsense. Why can't you aim for the moon, get that and the stars? And that should be your mentality going into this. So, I want you to think about what it is that you want to achieve on the goal side of things. I always go back to those fitness analogies, those health analogies. Envision yourself in the summertime looking fly, looking hot, hot, hot. I want you to envision your adult dog being obedient, sitting there not jumping on people, doing whatever that is that you, is in your goal of what a well-trained dog looks like. Now I want to tap into the fear side of things. And that's where I was saying envision what you don't want to see happen, um, whether it's from your personal experience or other people's. I want you to get motivation from other people. When I see um, other people in the gym killing it or out for a run and I know I skipped my run that day and I'm driving in my car and there's somebody in the rain running, I think, Pat, you're such a little weenie. My, my current guy who I'm getting inspired and motivated by is David Goggins. So check out his book, Can't Hurt Me. So I want you to get inspired by other people who are, are getting it. Maybe these same people who are inspiring you are also putting out information um, and, and can mentor you as well. So these people that I listen to as I listen to podcasts and audio books and um, other forms of digital growth that I convert to real life growth, some of these people put out information for you to soak up and implement. That's a beautiful thing in this day and age where it's a lot of people's business model to pour into people for free. That's what I'm doing right now and I love it. So for some people, it's a, it's a business strategy where it's more something that they have to do. For me, I love people soaking up my free content. I used to spend years and years at the shelter just taking dogs out. Why? Because I love this. So regardless of their motivation, there's a bunch of information out there for you to soak up. I just happen to think mine might be the best for you if you're of like-mindedness. I might not be the guy for you. I might not have the personality. I might be too, too little in one area, too much in another area. Approach-wise, you would never drink the Kool-Aid that I'm serving. No problem. Come here, hopefully I invoke some thought and then link up with somebody who does it for you because you have to like who you're working with. At the very least, you have to know that you guys are on the same team. So you don't... I take that back. You don't always have to like who you're working with, but you at least have to know that the goal is worth it and that you have to be a vessel to be poured into and implement. You should literally look at yourself as a doing machine. As I say in one of my videos, my role is almost to be like a computer programmer, right? Where I know how to you know, put the motherboard together and how to put the zeros and ones in place and all the idiosyncrasies to that. I know how to make my system work. You're the computer. Like you literally should just be doing your best to figure out what your script is and be sticking to that and just driving that process. And as you interact with your puppy, your puppy is just the end user. Your puppy is going to just to do certain things. Whenever your puppy does something, you have a response for that. It's just clicking on buttons. It's in my video I say in regards to obedience that it should be like a game of chess, like a game of chess on the computer where the second, boom, your puppy does something, you're pre-programmed to do something. Now I wanna take that a step further and say, your whole management process should be that. There's a lot of similarities between what you do on the field with your puppy, with food, fetch, and tug, and off the field in its development as well, just in the daily management, and that there's specific scripts that I give you. Not too much if you're just listening to podcasts or you're just uh, uh, jumping in and out of content freely with no structure, but I'm going to talk about that in one second in regards to setting and achieving your puppy training goals. Now that you have an idea of something that you, you should be pulled towards, you should literally be pulled towards this goal. Like there's a burning desire to get to it. And if you don't have that burning desire, you will end up somewhere in the middle. Hopefully a couple notches towards the side of what you're aspiring to get, but unless you have that drive, that fire in your belly, 
then you'll be better off for consuming and implementing some of this content, but you will not get to where you aspire to be. So you have a pull to get towards where you want to be and a kind of a push to get away from where you don't want to be. Um, for me, like, yeah, I'll drink occasionally, but man, I hate feeling hungover. That's, that's just for a guy who takes pretty good care of themselves, kind of, kind of a little bit metro, kind of a little bit of a diva um, with, with my upkeep. Hey, I only have one body, right? So why not cover it in bad tattoos, but then after that, take great care of it? <laughs> anyway, um, that is my, my push away from not feeling like crap. But my, my pull is, I know that, man, if I'm, if I'm sitting here drinking some fat tires and, and, and enjoying myself, that when I'm on that treadmill burning at like eight miles an hour and just, just on there just sweating, not huffing and puffing because I got those lungs in shape, but for every beer that I drink, that's like eight minutes, almost 10 minutes at eight miles an hour. If that beer's about 150 calories, I only burn 150 calories on that treadmill. Now I know I put my body into that, that mode where it's continuing to burn calories once I'm off that treadmill because I got that blood pumping and those muscles you know, working all day long. But again, that's my push away from you know, my fitness goals, which I'm kind of on a routine now. I just want to age, age well and not look like absolute crap in the summertime. But again, we're not shooting for that. I'm not entering a competition. This isn't a season of life where I'm preparing for a fight or a run or like a tough mutter if I was, that I would be in the state that I'm telling you to be in. That you have to have an end goal in mind that is short, medium, and long term. So let's get into the actual goal setting process now. And your goals probably look a lot like this. Having a dog that is responsive with commands, having a dog that walks on a loose leash, having a dog that you can just operate through throughout the day without a lot of structure and that doesn't make bad decisions. So those are like your goals that you're gonna like work towards. Now the goals that you're gonna push away from are gonna be nipping, jumping, chewing, potty training. Now that's the stuff you gotta get away from. So those are the things are, are your, kind of your push goals. So once you realize that they're one and the same, like, like, I don't always want you operating in the, in the defensive fear side. Like, I don't always want to be like, oh, I don't want to drink beer. It's going to make me feel bad. You know, you, you sound, you know, for me, I, I sound like a loser, especially if I say that in front of my friends. Jeez, like, they'll, they'll give me a wedgie and a, a swirly because my friends are kind of, at least my old friends, are kind of tough. <laughs> oh, man, that's why I like to keep them in my life. So they keep me real. Um, and then, more importantly, you're going to need quietly go towards your pull goals. So, so you're not pushing away from these things that you're fearful about. You're just constantly moving towards the goals that you aspire to achieve. So what I always think about like, like myself in my mind as I'm like hitting up the gym and going to these like through these different like um, pain points as, as, as I push myself is I'm an athlete. I picture myself like um, this is my lifestyle. Like this is just how I operate. Is is that I'm an athlete. So instead of me, at least for my case, like I'm a skinny dude. So like I don't want to look like you know like sickly. Basically, at my younger age right now, I'm in my mid 30s. And so for a lot of people, they, they their their push away is they don't want to look you know put on the weight. So I know if you're listening to this, you're like, shut up, dude. You like you're happy. You, know, you should be happy that you're skinny. This and that. And I know that I'm blessed on that front. I have my own crosses to bear and other areas of health and you know well-being and stuff like that. But going back to, to, to the topic at hand, I don't want to just say, like, I don't want to be skinny. I don't want to be skinny. If anything, I accept my body now, unlike before at a younger age where you know I would you know, do a bunch of supplements and lift crazy weights that were probably bad for my joints and I did look like a bodybuilder even though I shouldn't have. That's not you know the body that God gave me. And I just have a pulling towards, hey, I'm an athlete. I gotta go, I gotta get at this. And so I don't want you to think in the defensive mindset as you're striving towards your goals as just, hey, I don't want my dog to pee on the carpet. I don't want my dog to, you know, uh, bark at night in the crate. I wanna go to sleep. And I don't want like all this defensive stuff. Again, that's like me telling my, my buddies, well, I, you know, like blah, 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 guys. No, not cool. What I want you to do is just get at it. 
Just say, listen, my, my dog is a champion. And what do champions do? Champions don't go to bed early and give your dog a bunch of water and then get all mopey at two o'clock in the morning when you have to let your dog out because they're barking or they peed in the crate and then you're surprised about it. That's not what champions do. Champions have a structured schedule, just like champions in business and in the religious realm and the military for this analogy in sports. Sports players that win, man, like they have a structured lifestyle and schedule. And so if you want your dog to be a champion, you gotta raise your dog like a champion and not just worry about that defensive posture, that defensive lens where you're just you know pushing away from stuff. I don't wanna be fat. No, get, get at the gym, you're an athlete. Stop saying I don't wanna be. Just say I am and then start moving. What would an athlete do? Well, let's study athletes. Let's study world-class coaches and business leaders politicians, leaders um, across different realms. And that's what I do. And I study dogs. And so this is what we're gonna do to make sure you reach your goals. Just like everybody else world-class that is out there killing it. You are world-class, you are a champion. You are an athlete within a puppy training season. You're going to set that goal that we just talked about of all those manners and getting through all that behavioral nonsense. That's all that is. It's just a blip on the radar. That behavioral stuff, it's just temporary things that you're gonna get through and you're gonna own and drive the process from an offensive standpoint. That's, that's why I refer to the behavioral stuff casually, especially if you have a puppy. Now, if you have an adult dog that's actually putting the holes in people, that's um, resource guarding, that is, um, has extreme anxieties or behavioral concerns like counter surfing and, and things like that, well, that's a, different, that's a whole different ball game. Now you gotta probably do some more no-base training and, and, and have uh, to work with a local trainer that really knows what they're doing. So I'd screen thoroughly for that because everybody wants to take your money, but you have to have a certain experience level when you're working with some of those more difficult cases. Anyway, that shouldn't be you if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully. You have a puppy. And so you should literally refer to that those behavioral concerns, just like how I refer to my competition. They don't really matter. What matters is me, the offensive side. So yeah, you know what, I don't turn a complete blind eye to them. I know generally what they charge and you know what they got going on every once in a while, I'll jump on their social media and you know, just, just check them out. But I don't live in that realm. And that's why I want you to refer to this behavioral stuff somewhat casually. And if you embrace my, on the field, the offensive side of my game plan for you, you're gonna work out all the, all the behavioral stuff through management and coaching. You're gonna have to do next to no behavioral modification, any no base training or stuff like that. So, now that we know what the end goal is, we're going to reverse engineer it. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And you might say, before you start eating that element, Cut me up that, I don't know what the, the parts of an elephant are. Cut me up that butt cheek, I'm gonna eat that first. And then I'm gonna eat the ribs, you know? I guess I'll, like, you just eat the elephant one bite at a time. I'm gonna do a little bit of crock pot on this element. I'm gonna do a little bit of a skewer on this, ele uh, this elephant. And then, so now that we know that we have to eat an elephant, we're gonna figure out what order we're gonna eat it in, how we're gonna preserve that elephant meat in the meantime. I'm gonna use, plug a freezer in over there, and you know what, it might take a couple freezers. I'm gonna hit up my neighbor Joe. I know you know he's, he's actually has a business where he has a, um, a food service, so I'm gonna store some of this elephant over there. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I know, I just took a, a simple analogy and I peeled it back like five different onion layers. That's what I do. But that's what you're gonna do. So you're, we're gonna take this common, hey, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And we're literally just going to, to delve into that that analogy a little bit deeper. But now let's go back to puppy training. If you want a dog to respond around distractions off leash and just to be generally obedient, we're gonna go all the way back to my first week. I have four weeks in my training course. The first week, we do food motivation and management. If your dog is not hungry, you have nothing. If your dog is not hungry, you have jack squat. So I need your puppy clearing its food bowl every time with dry kibble in it only, unless there's a true medical reason. 
And if there is a medical reason, probably it's temporary and your goal should be to get your dog on dry kibble as quickly as possible while working with your vet and getting creative to get your dog as hungry as possible for the basics. Once your dog is eating quickly, from there, you're going to um, have it eat in small increments, feed it outside, have it eat in small increments outside. I have other videos and things you know, of that nature you can check out after this podcast. Then from there, you're gonna feed your dog out of the Kong Wobbler. The Kong Wobbler will make sure that it gets used to working for its food and then um, has that, that, that food drive right on time every time. If your dog's not willing to nudge a little plastic dog puzzle with its nose or, or a paw, it's not ready for you. Or yeah, there's sometimes where I work with clients in tandem where they're doing some of the stuff I just mentioned and then they start to do a little bit of food-based training and they roll out the Kong Wobbler usage in tandem with that because we're on an aggressive game plan and um, we're kind of doing two things at once. But in general, if we're just putting one foot in front of the other in, in this um, breakdown of meeting and, and achieving your puppy training goals, know that your dog needs to have food drive. And yeah, by going outside, you might say, well, Pat, why, why do you want me to feed my dog outside? That's kind of weird. You know, you have me doing all these weird things, Pat. You, you want me to feed my dog outside and you want me to have a leash inside? Doesn't that seem cattywampus, Pat? Well, you know what? Maybe to the naked eye. But by you feeding your dog outside, you're going to um, proof it to make sure that it at least wants to eat food outside because how can you train your dog outside if it doesn't want to even eat its food outside? That's like me trying to pay a rich person minimum wage. Well, maybe I can inspire them. Maybe they believe in my calls. Maybe they're doing it temporarily so they can make more money you know, a year or two down the road and they're paying it forward, but I cannot get a richy rich person with a crappy work ethic to work for minimum wage. Just don't happen and you will not be able to get your dog to focus on you outside if it will, uh, won't even consume its food outside. And in regards to the whole leash inside thing, well, leash is a management tool. It's not just used for walking your dog. All right, so week one, we talk about food motivation. Um, I'll have you do a couple drills where you have your dog just running up to you and sitting, just staying in the pocket with you and saying, hey, let's engage. I know you're running away from me, but hey, I wanna engage with you. Now, doesn't that sound like the opposite as to what you're currently doing? You're probably chasing after your dog, attempting to engage in it, trying to pet it while it's nipping you once you finally catch that little sucker. And what I'm doing is turning the tables from a, a psychology standpoint and getting your dog in the habit of running over to you and saying, hey, what do you want to do next? Because I want that food or I want that tug toy. So week one, we have your dog running up to you, getting uh, with a high level of drive and focus, running up to you and sitting. Week two, actually do five commands, five drills. First is sit, stay at the food bowl. Second is coming when called. Then when your dog gets to you after you have it come when called, also known as recall training, you're gonna do a look drill to teach your dog to look at you. You're gonna throw the food while your dog maintains the sit stay. So it gets used to seeing an item thrown and that taps into your dog's prey drive and showing impulse control. Helps for squirrels and what we're gonna do next when we do training through play. Lastly is a simple sit stay. While we're doing food-based training in small increments, like five minutes at a time uh, for every meal, whether it's two or three times a day, um, you're also, again, tightening up things from a management standpoint where you're going to those sprint, cool down, and rest daily regimen. Um, you're, you're just tightening up on there where your dog's chewing longer, your dog's sleeping longer, your dog's peeing more accurately. And in tandem with that, in this other category during week two, you're going to play more tug with your dog. It, using the same methodologies of moving back and having your dog continually come to you with the tug toy as it's retrieving and generally just punching in towards you and following you around wanting to engage with you. I'm very big on having a dog that naturally leans in towards you and wants to be with you because without that, you have nothing. If I don't have your attention as you're listening to this, if you're like, you know, talking to somebody else or like zoned out or whatever, I have nothing. In person, I need my kids, my wife, my employees, my clients, my dogs to be looking at me and focused on me. If I do not have a dog who's, who's anxiously like 
um, like coming back to me and looking at me, well, how are you going to have a good sit stay? How are you going to get your dog to come and call? It's going to be completely checked out. All right. So we did week one, management, motivation. Week two, more motivation, more management. Start to develop your dog's um, ability to continue to come back to you. Start to do some formal food-based training, all while increasing its primal tug drive. So that way in week three, we go into week three and we do the exact same thing we've done with food, with tug and fetch. Now when you start to hit these certain points where you say uh, verbal feedback that we do when we do like the look command in food-based training, it's gonna have your dog drop it. It's gonna go into this like spitting it out of its mouth mode from a motivational standpoint versus you having to like pinch your dog's gums or you know say drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it or anything ridiculous like that. So your dog's gonna go right into this mode out of sheer, out of its sheer subconscious behavior. It's gonna have these triggers, these cues that we're gonna tap into. All right, week four, we just continue the tightening process. Imagine like a, uh, an anaconda choking out a rabbit where it's just getting tighter. And then it takes a little breather and it gets tighter and tighter. And that's what we're doing. We're pacing ourselves. We're hitting these known milestones where that anaconda, man, it knows it's got that rabbit. She's just going through the process. And I want you to have that level of confidence as you start to get some wind in your sails. And week four, we're really tightening up. And so in between like week three and week four, I kick you outside with the food. You've already been outside with the food, just having your dog eat. Now I draw a line in the sand and I say, you're only allowed to train with food outside. Remember folks, food paves the way for food-based training. Food-based training paves the way for training through play. And what you do inside, you just keep scaling up. So food is gonna pave the way for food-based training outside, which is gonna pave the way for training through play outside. You start in your backyard, then you work your way to your front yard, all while using the leash in a way that's nice and light and helps feed off of your natural body language, your verbal communication with your dog, and its natural motivation to continue to come to you and engage. So that leash will be there as a little spotting tool to make sure, God forbid, you're sitting there playing tug with your dog in the front yard in a way that's natural. It's not feeling constant leash pressure, pulling and jerking. You can ensure that your puppy doesn't go running off. So, I know the first 20 minutes was just me on a banter about hopefully getting you fired up. Man, I'm fired up. If you can't tell that, then you must not have been listening. So I need you to be fired up and to, one, take advantage of all my free content. It's there for you. Go nuts with it. But if you really want to get this quickly, by all means, sign up with me. Um, I have notes in, in the text part of, of this podcast. I have other ways we can connect. Just simply click on the links that you see on the show notes and explore. Explore more what we can do together. So in my online training course, I have a bunch of webinars that I break down exactly what you need to do in a lot greater detail. I, I just gave you the framework. And so you can use my free videos and if you're on a super budget and you're, if you have a lot more time than you do money, if you just want to try to self-navigate your way through this, man, I made you playlist. There's, I had this on a couple different platforms now in regards to social media. You can do a lot with this, but think about what we can do. If I'm talking to you directly, I'm working with you intimately on, and actually like looking at the videos that you're doing. So instead of you just looking at my videos, a one-way monologue, we now get to have a dialogue. So. Anyway, go nuts with everything that I've given you so far. Uh, go back if you haven't listened to prior podcasts. Explore my other ways. So on your own, you can take your puppy and transform him or her into a champion. Remember, champion puppy owners, action over anxiety, discipline equals freedom. Take the next step. Do what you know how to do. Drive the puppy training process. Truly commit yourself to this, hit it hard for a short period of time so you can stop working on your dog and simply enjoy them. I'll see you next time. Peace! 
If your dog is not hungry, you have nothing. If your dog is not hungry, you have jack squat. 